One of the most challenging landscapes a logging crew will encounter is a forest that has been hit by a natural disturbance, resulting in storm-damaged timber. Timber can be impacted by hurricanes, tornadoes, and wind shear. Each weather pattern presents its own problems, but universal concerns with any disturbance are overhead hazards and tension wood. When coming onto a storm-damaged track of timber, pro loggers are encouraged to pay extra attention for overhead hazards. And when the harvesting begins, Communication and teamwork between crew members is crucial to reducing the risk in the woods. Brian Wagner, chainsaw trainer with Forestry Mutual, is going to take us through a quick review of properly addressing storm-damaged timber. I'm Brian Wagner, Forestry Mutual insurance company, logger safety trainer. Uh, my job at Forestry Mutual is basically to work with our logging account holders uh, trying to avoid risk. Uh, and today we're up in uh, Appomattox County, Virginia, and we're amongst a bunch of risk. Uh, there was a tornado outburst here earlier in the year, and we've got logging crews actually trying to salvage some of this uh, storm damage, and that's why we're here today. Uh, there are certain techniques, uh, certain mind thoughts that can, can reduce risk, so we've got the guys going home the same way they came in the morning. Uh, what we're trying to do, the, the big picture, is, is to get rid of the exposure and the risk. When we eliminate or reduce the exposure and risk, you know, the chance of that accident happen is re reduced by quite a bit. So that's what we're gonna be doing today uh, with the salvage um, project. This particular area that we're at uh, today, uh, from what I can see, I think there was at least two separate tornadoes. And of course, a tornado is going to have a lot smaller track than what a hurricane would have. Uh, what we're dealing with here today is, you know, uprooted trees. Um, behind me is a pretty good overhead hazard where the tree actually was spun around and it remains up in the air. But uh, we're covering the, the, the storm's track. We've got this logging job running across the road from us now. Uh, the first thing that they're going to do basically is study the blowdown path. Uh, see where most of the timber, you know, the, the direction of the, of the wind blow was. Because uh, he'll want to set his deck or, or landing up so that th those stems could re be removed very efficiently. Uh, another thing he's looking at is road access, being able to get the log trucks, chip vans onto the road in, in a safe manner without causing trouble you know, with, with the public and everything else uh, entering the highway. Uh, environmentally, if we can have the landing or the deck area set up where the, the skidding is efficient, it, it, it's gonna lessen the ground compaction. So when this uh, timberland starts to grow back, you know, we don't have issues with, with, with compacted soil conditions. You know, that's, hopefully it, it'll grow the timber back, you know, the, the same quality that what got damaged in the natural disaster. Well, time can be of the essence in salvaging timber before it begins to lose its value. There is some value in letting the dust settle before moving a crew into the storm-damaged forest. If, if we could let the timber actually rest uh, after the uh, natural disaster occurs, what happens is the tension relaxes uh, to a point where after a, a fresh uh, damage, that, that, that tension is just waiting to be released. So if we could let that relax a little bit, you know, the, the chance of picking up injury to one of my guys is you know, a little bit less. As with any logging operation, Communication is key to safety. Communication is, is one of the keys uh, of preventing an accident out here. Uh, what I try to do with, with some of these techniques that I teach, I'm specifically trying to keep the man away from the moving logging equipment. Because a lot of times, if, if the guy gets too close to the machine or the machine crowds the, the ground man, that results in a claim for us. So if I can keep the separation there, that's what we're looking to do. Uh, as far as communication, uh, the thing that we strive with our training is, just because the machine is sitting there, don't take for granted that operator of a cutter, skidder, loader can see the man looking out of the machine. 
So what we try to do is number one, be seen, you know, with our safety colors, either this uh, blaze orange or the new chartreuse color is great because we can catch that way out in our peripheral vision. Uh, what I t try to tell the guys is if you've got to approach any piece of equipment, cutter, skidder, loader, by all means, uh, make a signal to him and the uh, operator of the equipment is gonna do the same. So he acknowledges my, my presence. Uh, he'll put his hydraulic stuff on the ground, blade down, grapple down, the head of the cutter, uh, disc stopped uh, on the ground, and then we can approach the machine for you know, further communication. And a lot of this is gonna be done with a skidder in, in this salvage uh, operation. Uh, what this particular job is doing here the smaller diameter, probably 18 uh, up to 24 inch uh, blow down, they're actually taking those stems to the loader where the uh, loader will mechanically cut the root ball off. Uh, I love it because I don't have a man that, that is physically there within arm's reach of possible tension wood. Uh, we don't have that exposure on this job. So that th things are looking real well as, as, as far as th their pr thought process. Uh, trying to do everything mechanized that they can, avoiding the, hu the human manual exposure. On the bigger timber, what has to be done sometimes is manual uh, re re releasing the stem from the root clump. Uh, and that's where my job comes in because there's different techniques that I can prevent you know, the, the stem or the root clump from moving. And we're gonna go into that a little bit later in this uh, project but we're gonna be talking about what we call a tongue and groove lock. Typically, when we cut a root ball, the reaction is, is the root ball going back in the hole that it was blown over in. I don't like that because there's a lot of movement uh, all of a sudden within an arm's reach of where my man is. So what we're trying to do is to teach this tongue and groove lock where it's just like a piece of furniture. Here, here's the tongue and here's the groove that prevents that stem from being released until it's mechanically grabbed with the, with the machine. And all that's gonna happen then is he's gonna pull the tongue out of the groove. In the meantime, my man is way away from the equipment and anything that could happen way out into the top of this tree, we haven't got manual exposure there. So that's, that, that's the great thing about using some of these locks is it, it prevents that tension or movement from happening. Uh, plus, I don't have a set of legs there or a human body that could be injured. One of the keys when addressing a storm damaged area is dealing with tension wood. Tension wood basically is when the wood gets bent, okay? The tension on this stick of wood that I'm holding here is going to be on the outside bend because that wood is actually being stretched. So in a way of describing things, when I train my guys, I try to have their bodies on the good side of, of a situation. When we get uh, tension wood here, this outside or the tension wood side of this stick is gonna be the bad side. Because if a cut should be made down here, here's your reaction. And if a cut should be made up here, you know, there, there's your reaction there. Well, my way of looking at it if I don't have a body or a pair of legs on the bad side, I don't, have, I don't have an injury that has occurred there. What we try to do is to keep our guys on the compressed side of, of the bent wood or the tension wood, because if something happens, it, it's always gonna be going away from the body. So we, we strive to keep the, keep the human body on the good side versus the bad side. Spring pole uh, is, is very common in, in any sort of natural disaster. Basically, it, it's caused by uh, something taking a smaller tree to the ground. And what we're left with is that the, the stem is under tension. There are several techniques that can be used to trap or release the tension that do not put the chainsaw operator in a dangerous position. The tongue and groove lock, ba basically, it's like a piece of furniture. Uh, you've got your tongue and it, it's a groove. What I would typically do on, on this stem here is I would bore through the, the side of the stem and I would make a up cut. And as soon as the up cut goes by where the bore hole was, quit and then come up from the top, 
saw down un until your down cut goes by where the bo bore hole was. And what we've set up basically is here's your tongue here and here's the groove. And it, it remains stationary un until it's mechanically removed. What would happen on this stem here, the grapple would, would grapple the, the stem here and he would go to pull it and actually he's just pulling the tongue out of the groove. And it, let, let, let the root clump go back in the hole. I don't have a, a set of legs or a human body you know, near all that movement. Top lock and limb locks are basically what we teach in the topping and limbing uh, section of a any type of a timber harvest, whether it's storm damage or conventional uh, harvest in, in the logwoods. Basically what we're trying to do is to avoid sudden release of tension. So all that we're going to do with these limb locks and top locks, they're offset cuts that um, we're going to actually be able to have the top of the tree severed, but w with the offset cut it's going to prevent uh, sudden tension release. We're going to let the piece of mechanized equipment release the tension when my timber cutter is away from the site. Side tension limb lock, again we're dealing with good side, bad side. Any time that we have wood that's bent, uh, the outside bend of the bent wood is going to be the tension side. What we try to do is to avoid that tension from being released and, and maybe getting my guys in, in both legs or st striking the body. So we're going to use the uh, limb lock. The, the first cut is going to be alongside the stem and we're going to offset to the outside. When those two cuts cross each other, we're done with it. But at the same time, the offset cut ha has blocked the, the, the tension from being suddenly released. And hopefully my saw hand is going to have his body in, in, on the good side so if something should happen there's, there's not going to be any contact with, with legs or, or the body. What we're doing with any locking uh, cut is we're making it so that, that tension is not released when I've got a human body there. You know, we're, we're allowing the machine to aid in, in, in releasing that tension. At the same time I haven't got legs or a human body there to be uh, struck, you know, if, if the tension wood releases. Part of my training is making sure that my man is on the good side and not the bad side. Uh, so that's all of a, a thought process that goes through in, in the training uh, portion of the thing. The first hazard to tackle is the spring pole. Guys, this is a spring pole. Probably one of the most dangerous things that a timber cutter comes across in, in his day-to-day -day, uh, activities. This spring pole was caused by this white oak going over uh, and pinning this to the ground. What is developed here is a bunch of tension wood. Now if we look at this spring pole in a just way to look at it, the outside bend of this thing is where the tension wood is. Uh, on the inside is what we call compressed wood. Again, I've got to stress, if we can keep the manual exposure away from this, let the machine get it. We try to use the mechanized equipment on this. If there's no human exposure, there's no risk, and I don't have anybody injured, use mechanical means to get rid of these things. However, if it is called, these have to be removed, and manual is the only way we can do it, I'm going to show you a way that we can safely remove these so the guy gets back in the truck nighttime the same way he got out in, in, in the morning. If we look at this spring pole, the oak has got the thing pinned to the ground there. Before that oak tree hit this, th this small white oak was growing straight up in the air. If you can imagine a straight line uh, up the back of this spring pole as being here, across the back of the bow here. If we can make another imaginary straight line, we get a 90 degree angle. Take your 90 degree angle, bisect it into a 45 degree angle, and we find the sweet spot. On this particular tree, straight line, straight line, that sweet spot is gonna be right in here. Now, two ways to cut this spring pole. I generally teach one. 
if I get the sweet spot identified, I can hit the back of the tree with a power saw. But remember guys, that's tension wood. Wood does not move until tension wood is severed. So the reaction of me hitting the back of this tree in, in the tension side of it, it's gonna react very quick. What I teach my guys is if I can come up underneath the compression wood, and what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna shave. Guys, do not put your saw straight into that sweet spot, okay? It, it'll pinch you tighter than tight. But get in here and shave. Ideally, what I want to do is by sawing this compression wood, I'm going to be able to react if I'm too high or too low. What I really am looking to do is to put that so that stab goes back together so it shows that I've done it perfect. The great thing about being able to adjust this thing is I can be off a couple inches one way or the other, but I got the job created or done safely without maybe losing a teeth or possibly broken jaw, kickback, all that stuff is eliminated. But again, guys, I'm gonna stress, if you haven't got to put a chainsaw into this type of wood, do not do it. Let the machine take it. Well, guys, let's go ahead and take care of this. Uh, we're gonna take care of the PPE, got my ears and muffs down. Uh, gonna properly start the saw, brake on, leg lock start. When we get done cutting this spring pole off, you'll notice what I did was I got rid of the stab. There's nothing better to go through a skidder tire or a cutter tire. So after this spring pole has been removed, get rid of the stab and, and we don't have a damage to equipment or if somebody fell on this thing, very serious. If that risk isn't there, we don't have the injury. Now we're going to step into some field demonstrations of these techniques. The first being the tongue and groove. This next exercise that we're going to uh, be talking about is suspended wood and uh, things that we can do to prevent movement. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we've got root balls here, root clumps. Uh, what has been happening on this job, and again guys, we've been stressing you know, mechanize, mechanize, mechanize. Normally, these would have been pulled over to the deck and the buck saw would have cut these things off so there's gonna be no manual exposure to none of my guys. But this is gonna be just a, a little exercise where we can get some thought process going. Looking at this thing, the first stem right here, it, it's got the root ball connected to it. Uh, basically, we're on the uphill side of it here. Uh, if this thing should be released, most likely it, it, it's coming here. So in normal circumstances where I'm standing right now, I would be on the bad side of this root clump in stem situation. But I want you to look at is something just a little bit more. Look at this second root ball right here, okay? Now, that is actually going to be a shield for me if I get on the good side of, of this stem here, uh, number one, I'm going to be on the uphill side of the thing. And number two, I've got a shield with it. So I am doubly insured there. Now, what I'm going to do with this thing is normally when we cut a, a root ball off, that clump is going to go back into the hole. Okay? There's a lot of movement happening right within arm's reach of, you know, where I'm sawing that thing off. 
So all through the day today, we've been talking about reducing the movement, okay? So what I'm gonna do with this thing is I'm gonna put a tongue and groove lock on it to further protect myself. Because with the tongue and the groove, he's gonna come in here with the skitter, grapple it, and when he pulls it, he's just gonna move the tongue out of the groove. And in the meantime, Brian's gonna be up the line somewhere away from all that movement, the equipment, and everything else. In other words, there's gonna be no exposure to Brian here. He, he's gonna be gone. All right, guys, now, my body is on the good side of this thing about two different ways. I'm on the uphill side of this root clump, and number two, I've got a built-in shield, so that's thing, there's nothing gonna be coming my way. What I'm gonna do on top of it is I'm gonna put a tongue and groove lock on here, and it's gonna prevent movement. Once I get done with that lock, I'm gonna walk away from this thing, down, down the line and, and get the next one that I've got to cut. So, we're gonna put the ears down, my visor down, guys, proper start every time. Leg lock right here, straight out of the recoil. guys uh, just a little recap on what we've done guys this stem is cut okay there wasn't any movement whatsoever while I was making this cut number one I'm on the uphill side of this thing if something should have happened it's gonna happen on the downhill side of it but look at my shield you know the shield re remains there it was good to go the third piece of insurance that I used so this thing didn't go back into the hole, I've got a tongue and groove set up. And actually, I left the tongue on this side, and here's the groove. When the skitter comes in, he's probably going to grapple that thing right there. Or guys, another trick of this thing, if he came down this road and bladed th this root clump, he could pop that tongue out of that thing that way. So he's got a couple different options to use. But guys, the most important part of this thing, there was no human body here. I'm way down the line, you know, harvesting the rest of this wind thrown stuff. And I don't have exposure, number one, to the movement here. And number two, I'm not too close to the equipment. So all of that exposure, you know, we, we've got rid of that risk. So the chance of bodily injury just isn't there. So that's kind of what we're looking at, is to get a good thought process going. Guys, what we're going to do here is I, I'm going to cut that oak tree, but I'm in, in the process of cleaning some of this stuff up. What I'd like to show you is a different, I guess you can call it, it's not really a lock, but, but it's a way to clean some of this stuff up and still have some control over it by using the fiber. What I'm going to actually do with this thing, th 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 this thing has, has load on the bottom. I'm gonna actually notch the top of it because the tension wood is on the bottom of this. So it's gonna be almost like I'm cutting the tree down from the top, but I'm gonna face notch the top of this thing, cut it from the bottom working up, and I'm gonna leave hinge wood, okay? That cut works real well if I should have one standing up in the air that I'm trying to walk down, rather than coming up from underneath it and just keep blocking that thing down. I feel if I've got that hinge wood there, I've got just that little bit more of control going on. So I'll just show you that real quick. What I'm gonna do is face notch the top, cut it from the bottom. I'm gonna shut the saw off and then actually pick that thing up from the back. 
j just to show you the control that we've still got. So let's go ahead and try that. Uh, got my ears down, eyes down, brake on. Okay, what I've got left here is hinge wood, okay? And just to show you how that works, I'm gonna come back here and actually show you how that, you know, this hinge works here. I've still got control of this thing by a hinge. And it's just a little bit different, you know, to show you. Um, you know, there, there may be a specific time that you might wanna use that. Well, you've got that little bag of tricks in your pocket that, that you can, you know, use it another date, but, uh, Thanks guys, we'll finish cleaning this up and get this tree cut. Guys, what uh, we've run into here is, I wanna show you how the, the, the side limb lock works. Uh, basically with a limb lock, it's the same as a top lock. We're trying to sever the stem without having movement. Looking at this thing here, it's gonna have a good side, bad side, Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to cut this limb from the good side because I've got wood on the other side and I don't want to place my body in a, in a pinch point. So I'm going to have to cut this thing from the bad side. But if you can look at the load on this, uh, this crotch, I'm going to keep my legs back from the swing path of this thing should the thing let go even if I put a, a, a lock in it. But my first cut is going to be right in there tight to the stem and you're telling yourself brian if you keep cutting right there that's going to pinch you well exactly and what i'm going to be looking for is that pinching uh, deal with the wood when i see that i'm going to take the saw out and guys remember we're not meeting that cut because if i do that pressure tension it is released immediately what I'm gonna do, guys, is offset to the outside, and as soon as that outside cut bypasses where the inside cut was, I'm done. That wood's cut this far this way, and I've gone by it, it's cut. What we've done is we've formed a shelf or a shoulder keeping that thing from taking that ride back at these two legs, okay? So let's go ahead and do that cut. Uh, ears down, eyes down, proper start. I'm uh, just going to do that lock just real quick. Uh -huh. 